Allez. Yeah, so it would be great if you could share with us your thoughts on that possible decomposition, decolonization of Russia. What do you think about that? And what sort of, let's say, world order, security order there could be or would be if this is going to happen? So you have like seven minutes and then we will try to give you three minutes for questions. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a really great honor to be part of this historic conference and I've listened with great interest to some of the other conclusions. I think the real answer is we don't know, but we need to find out. The lack of strategic thinking about what a post-Putin Russia <coughs> could be like, would be like, should be like, um, is enormous. And apart from this excellent effort that you're making, there is really very little discussion of this. When I face a problem, I tend to look at history. And I think the first thing that we should do when we look at this is to see what are the historical mistakes that we've made and what are the things that we got right in history. So what we got right in history was, for example, Captive Nations Week, um, the third full week in July, still commemorated by the United States, um, instituted in the um, late 1950s, was a very important way of showing that not just for the Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians who were occupied um, de jure by the Soviet Union, but also for other captive nations um, within the Russian Federal uh, within the Soviet Union, and actually with, under the control of the People's Republic of China, um, that there was someone in the West was still thinking about them, and I, I, I wouldn't say that this sort of symbolic effort involving calendars and names and so on is decisive um, but it's a start i remember during the cold war the um way in which the polish government in exile in london which had no budget no executive power at all but just by being there it showed that the so-called people's republic of poland didn't have absolutely uncontested space um the uh, idea that there was the legitimatia, that there was a little passport that they gave, um, that you could pay a contribution to the um, national treasury just to say there is another Poland um, and that you were making your contribution towards that as an emigre Pole. The embassies of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, which survived throughout the occupation period, again, had no real function except to issue passports to people who wanted them and in my case also a visa but they were a constant niggling reminder to the occupation authorities. We don't have it all our own way. I might also mention the, the BNR, the Belarus National Rada, which has been in exile since 1918, but still just a reminder to the authorities in Minsk um, that your claim on legitimacy and sovereignty is contested. So I think that, that's the first thing to do, is to try and build up the emigration pillar as far as we can. Because that gets onto the how do we make it happen. The, the success stories, I would say, in the post-Soviet space have been where we've been able to combine strong local democratic movements with um, movements for sovereignty and independence or the restoration of independence with a uh, well-connected, dynamic and benevolent uh, diaspora. And I'm looking particularly at the Baltic states here. It was really impressive to see politicians from the um, diaspora, people like Valdis Adamkus, Thomas Hendrik Ilvis and others coming back to the Baltic states post-1991 and playing a very important part in the democratic process, bringing expertise and connections that inevitably the people um, from the domestic wing of the independence struggle um, didn't have. And so the time to start on that is now. I would love to see more on Idel Oral. Um, I'd like to see more um, uh, Circassian diaspora activity. We have great uh, um, presence at this conference from Boratia. That's good. But let's do that. It all starts putting weight on the other side of the balance. And it's not just symbolic um, political and institutional efforts. It's also about creating civil society. Uh, we need to think about media, about university studies, about every sort of alternative to the Kremlin-controlled imperial regime 
in these countries. And that's, that's really important, and that should already give us plenty to do. We also need to keep, and this is a more controversial effort, we need to keep um, ties um, across the new Iron Curtain. Now, I know there is a very strong argument that we should just boycott everything to do with the Russian Federation, completely have an absolute embargo on all cultural, economic, social, people-to-people -people ties. And I absolutely um, understand that argument, and I respect very much the people who make it. They say Ukraine is bleeding right now, and let's just put the fullest possible weight on the imperial authorities in Moscow. But I think the counter-argument to this is probably stronger. We've got to think about this strategically. Um, Russia's not going to go away. It's, there will be something, some kind of um, political formation or formations on the territory of what's now the Russian Federation um, for all of our lives. And we need to start planning for this. We can't simply say that the military defeat of the Russian uh, um, invasion forces is the top, but also the only priority. And after that, who cares? I think that's irresponsible. We need to start planning now um, for what we can do in a post-Putin, post-Kremlin, post-imperial Russia. And and I think that that must involve building contacts where we can, um, inside Russia, sharing information, um, understanding what the issues are, and also how we can best help our um, tar target our, our efforts. I think that the, the, the two big questions we're going to have to deal with in this are one, nuclear weapons, and the second is China. Now, the West has an absolute horror of the Russian nuclear arsenal. It's the single biggest problem I have to deal with in my arguments in London and Berlin and other, country, other Western capitals, is people say, well, supposing the Russians go nuclear, we're risking World War Three. So there's a kind of nuclear neurosis, sort of nuclear phobia in the West, which doesn't, um, I think, have full base in rationality. <laughs> And that's true whether it's the nuclear weapons in Putin's hands or the nuclear weapons not in Putin's hands. So I think that the discussion we've had already, but there needs to be more of this, how do we deal with a post-Putin Russia in terms of the international regime for non-proliferation, for arms control, and, and, and so on. That's going to be a very big priority for the West. We don't want to use the American phrase, loose nukes. We more or less didn't have them during the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, but we could have done, and that's going to be that's going to be a, a very important item. And we need to have some answers on that. What's what's the plan? Um, how do we make sure they're properly guarded? How do we make properly 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 disposed of? What's happening to command and control? Um, who's going to? And I, we and we missed a trick on this. Um, to be blunt, in 1991, when we allowed the Soviet Union. Uh, to collapse, which was great, and we encouraged that. But we also allowed the um, Russian Federation to take over from the Soviet Union without any questions. They took the Security Council seat, they took the assets, they sort of took on some of the liabilities, although not reparations. But we really need to look at what we got wrong in 1991 and try and make sure we don't do get get that wrong again. And the other big issue is China. We are in geopolitical competition with China. China is is also an empire. It occupies. Southern Mongolia, it occupies Tibet, um, it occupies um, East Turkestan, which is known in, in Chinese as uh, Xinjiang. And um, I think that we will face an immediate problem with China, um, arguing not totally irrationally that it wants to stabilise what's happening on its borders. And so we really need to think that, think that through. Um, we don't have the conditions we had during the um, Western intervention from 1918 to 1922 when China was very weak. China was on the back foot in geopolitical terms. And although the West made um, huge mistakes and the intervention during the Russian Civil War was unsuccessful, we didn't have to worry about what does China think about that. And this time, this time, this time we will. So any attempts we make in terms of, of, of state building or in um, political reconfiguration in post-Soviet, uh, post-Putin Russia, we'll have to deal with the Chinese. So we better start thinking about that um, pretty carefully as well. And that will be a mixture of reassurance and of deterrence and um, some quite um, important diplomacy will be needed there. 
I'm keen. I'm aware that the, the schedule is already bursting at the seams, and I perhaps won't um, take up all my time in order to leave some time for questions. But I would just say one more thing, which is that I think that we, we missed a trick um, post-1918 with the emigration. There was enormous um, Russian or emigration from the territory of the Soviet Union. We often talk about the Russian elements in that, and they're, of course, very important people like um, Bunin, Beberova, um, other big literary figures. We talk particularly about the Paris um, end of that. It wasn't only Russians. Um, don't forget the founder of Idel Oral went to Turkey and became the important advisor to Ataturk. His granddaughter, who I'm in contact with in Turkey, still cherishes um, that memory. But I think that we need to look at the this big Putin era emigration strategically and think what do we do to build these are not necessarily people who are pro Western, they're not necessarily anti imperialist. I had a great joke from my friend in Tbilisi who said these new Russian emigres think that Georgia is a restaurant and the Baltic states is somewhere to go on holiday. They don't understand that these are real countries and they still they bring the imperialist mindset with them. But we need to work on that. Um, we want, need to make sure this, this new emigration, the post February emigration, isn't. Um, held in political, economic, ecclesiological, any other kind of he he hegemonic grip by the Kremlin. We need to start using that as the ingredients for our post-Putin Russia, and that will mean work. Um, and um, I can't imagine a better team of friends and allies than the people we have here at the conference. So there's masses to do. We should have started 30 years ago, but at least we're starting now. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I look forward with such interest to f your future efforts, um, to the discussion, for the rest of the conference, and my thanks once again to dear Hannah Hopko and her colleagues for inviting me. It's been a great honor to address you. Thank you, Edward, very much for your thoughts and food for thought. Uh, I would um, maybe give an opportunity for a short one question, if there is any. There is one at the back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lucas, for your opinion. Uh, I think you were the first one to mention China in this point of view. I think there's a lot of talking points uh, where people are saying we need Russia uh, to protect uh, the West against China, which is not true because Russia is a proxy state of China, just as is North Korea. So question is, would it be logical for China if Russia now exhausts all its forces in Ukraine, they're already using 85% of their you know, land, land troops, that China will basically uh, intervene and does a special military operation in Russia to stop basically, uh, you know, the war, remove Putin from the power, and then let's say give the the nations uh, an opportunity to you know to decide for themselves at least temporarily because China doesn't really intend to to culturally you know make the, the the nations Chinese, but at least economically they will be more and more involved in the far east of Russia. Thank you. Well, thank you for that really excellent question, which is something I've reflected on a great deal over the last few months, and I don't have a definitive answer. I think that the there's two things are clear. One is Xi Jinping does not want a catastrophic defeat for Russia, and the second is he doesn't want the war to carry on indefinitely, because the spike in prices for fuel and for food and for fertilizer are, are bad for China and China's in not great shape at the moment. When I say China, I don't mean Republic of China on Taiwan, I mean the People's Republic, of course. Um, so China's got skin in the game in the Ukraine war, but I would be very cautious about assuming that China's actually going to intervene. Chinese record, the Chinese record in multilateral um, overseas long distance diplomacy is really, really poor. They, even on North Korea, which is an important topic for them, they um, don't pursue a, a diplomatic line that anyone would say was expert and effective. Um, they have been, they've, they are in the contact group on North Korea, and that's basically it. They've shown very little interest in getting involved in any of the problems um, in African countries where they have a stake there ability to do the 17 plus one, which was their big effort in Eastern Europe, has been a really catastrophic failure. So put crudely, I think China sucks at um, multilateral diplomacy. And they've not played their hand um, 
very expertly, I would argue, with even with countries that want to be friends with them, like um, Lukashenko's Belarus. So I think we are. You're absolutely right that we shouldn't expect Russia or the Kremlin um, and its current leadership to be an ally against China. I don't think that we will. I, I suspect we will not see um, Chinese overseas military operations um, in any sort of stabilisation or intervention um, in Ukraine. It's just so far out of their comfort zone. This is the sort of thing they do in films, and many people here may have watched Wolf Warrior 2. If you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend it as an example of an insight into the Chinese imperialist mindset. But the idea you'd actually see Chinese troops um, positioned in the um, Donbass as peacekeepers, I think is unlikely. I think it's more likely that China intervenes to provide either more economic support to Putin to stop him losing or to arm twist him and say, now you have to do a deal. And I think if they see that Putin is losing quite badly, that Putin is being reckless in his loss and is threatening either or contemplating escalation against the West, which they wouldn't want, <coughs> or doubling down on his conventional military strategy and facing even greater losses and possibly a catastrophic disintegration of the Russian armed forces. I think the Chinese at that point, or Xi Jinping, might make the call to Putin and say, look, we're going to have to put some um, res restrict our economic ties with you if you can't come to the table, get you know, go for a deal while it's still there, um, because um, the alternative may be worse. Um, but thank you for your excellent question, and um, I'm sure that in the weeks ahead we'll have many more opportunities to come back to it. Thank you once again for, for your time and uh, for joining us and have a nice weekend and all the best.